be sure to follow us on Instagram at criminalafpod or click on the link in the episode description. In 1987, a convicted child killer and rapist was granted early release from prison. What would follow would rock Rochester, New York to its core as multiple women would go missing and ultimately found dead. Be warned, this story is not for the weak. I'm Dave Jari. I'm Garrett Gorder. And this is Criminal as Fuck. What's good, everybody, and welcome back to another fucked up episode of Criminal AF. Once again, I'm Dave Jari, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Garrett Quarter. How we doing? What's going on, bub? Nothing much, buddy. Ge- gearing up for Christmas. Yeah. Finishing some last-minute shopping. Last-minute shopping. Yeah, dude. It's the best time of the year. What are you looking for? Um, I still need to get... I still need to get Kelly a gift. You, need to get, you gotta get the missus a <laughs> gift. I still gotta get the missus a gift. Hey, I mean, when you have kids, you know... You, oh, they're done. They've been done. The parent, you know, the mom and dad, the... Yeah. They're at the bottom of the list, you know. Yeah, but I, I can't just... I've never been the person that just... I, I have a throw, All right, go ahead. Has she been naughty or not? <laughs> Both. <laughs> no. I I never the person that just does, like, a last-minute gift. I have to... It has to be thoughtful. Yes, it can't, I'm the same it, way. It can't just be, oh, I got you some tooth... Like, whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? A, a stocking stuffers or whatever like that. No. I yeah. gotta... I gotta, I gotta I'm, not, I'm the same way. Like, you know, like, someone could, could mention something 10 months ago that they would like or they would need or, you know, something that interests them. Yeah. I'll put that in the old fucking memory bank. Yeah. And, just wait, wait on it. Yeah. That's the, that's the problem. She hasn't given me. I've been waiting for that. All Usually, right. there's always something. Hmm. She's just been in that mood where it's like it's all about the kids. It's yeah. all about the kids and nothing else. And I'm like, just give me and and you gotta you gotta like have something for yourself though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh no, she, she, she'll she'll come around eventually. She'll she'll and I'll have to go last minute like the all the other <laughs> people that are like on the twenty fourth <laughs> wrestling around the the mall. That's awesome. So we'll figure it. We'll figure it out. We'll yeah, figure it yeah, out. yeah. All right. So we have a belated criminal shout out as well as a new one. Jan O'Donnell joined our criminal family just prior to the loss of my brother and never received a proper criminal AF shout out. Thank you, Jan. And I apologize for not recognizing you sooner. Jan, you're the best. Joining Jan and our other amazing criminals is Lissa Perello, who has already recruited some fellow listeners to criminal AF. Tell a friend to tell a friend. It's the best way. Is I it? love it. Tell Just, you know. Spread the word. I know. We're, we're a little rough sometimes. You might, you know, some people don't like vulgar language and like fuck and yeah. all these other things. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. tell one friend to tell another friend. Yeah, that's, that's all it takes. Uh, Alyssa is a fellow, uh, what do we call ourselves? Connecticuters? Connecticut. Wait. Connecticutians? No, it's Connecticuts? No. A fellow Quaker? I don't know. It's not, definitely not Quaker. <laughs> a fellow nutmegger? Got it. Oh, it is nutmeggers. It's it is not, all right, all right, all right, yep. all right, all right. Good, 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 yep. good, good. She's yes. a fellow nutmegger, along with Garrett and I. Jan and Lissa, you are both amazing, and we appreciate you. You can become a criminal as well by joining our Patreon at patreon.com backslash criminal AF. Also, if you have commitment issues like I do, <laughs> we started a one-time donation program through the website Buy Me a Coffee, where you can go to buy one, two, or dare we say three coffees to support what we do. So whether you want a long-term relationship with us or just a one-night stand, <laughs> both the options can be found in the episode description. Now, for those of you joining us for the first time, this is a true crime podcast. There will be talk of murder, rape, torture, assault, and pretty much any crime that would haunt you nightmares at any given moment. There will be detailed descriptions of set events, and there will be some vulgar language. Like, bitch. Oh, Wow! Great. Yeah, okay. I, I couldn't. I couldn't say the last week. It was <laughs> I, I no. To, I, I, last week, cunt. Oh, it still cut me. We have so much feedback on that. I know. It's, is it bad? No. People, oh. people loved it. Wow. A lot of our, you know, Brit friends from o- oh, o- yeah. over the pond. Of course, and it was from Aussie. over the pond. Listen, it's. A, I'm. I'm starting a petition to normalize the word cunt in the United States. It's never going to happen. No, nope, it'll happen. It's never going to happen. You know again. why? Because I'm going to say it at least 15 <laughs> times in this episode. You heard it here first, yeah. guys. No, because because Ian over over on the other side of the pond, he uh, he gave me some uh, good uh, scenarios on how to use the word cunt, which doesn't make it sound so bad. Australia or Brit? Brit. Okay. So, for example, if I don't like you, if I think you're an asshole, yeah. like you're a shit cunt. Like that Gary, he's a shit cunt. 
You know what I mean? It doesn't, mm. sound, it doesn't sound so bad. No, right? no, no, no. Right? It doesn't. You know, if you're talking about somebody you don't like, you whatever color hair they have, like say if they have red hair, you fucking call them a ginger cunt. <laughs> yeah. Fuck that ginger cunt. You know what I mean? A lot of variations on it. Mm. Like you say, uh, what does Ian say here? Like someone says something stupid, you're like, ah, what a cunt. Or if you like someone, you know, someone's hey. Oh, we're using this as yeah. as, as as general, like as a pickup line, huh? Right. No, I mean, if you <laughs> if you like someone, you know, you like if I oh, if I said, hey, do you no. know do you know Sally? And, and you're like, oh, yeah. what a cunt. No, well, you can't say that if you don't like her. But if you like her, you say, oh, she's a lovely cunt. Oh well, she's a lovely cunt. <laughs> There's no shot. Yeah. You are, dude. Is that see, there that's is the thing. no that's shot? The thing in the you are States. at the bar. No, that. And wait, no, no, let me pick the picture for you. You are at the bar, yep. right? You're buying a girl drinks all night, yeah. right? She's feeling you. You're getting the eyes. Oh, she's a lovely cunt. Yeah. <laughs> you walk up to her and you say, "Oh, you're a lovely cunt." There's no way. That's why it's we over. need to. That's it's why we need over. to normalize it. That's why we need to normalize it. And I'm starting it right now. <laughs> There's so many other better things to say than <laughs> what a lovely cunt. <laughs> Uh, oh man, this, you can have so much fun with with the word. I, I'm with you. It's I, yeah. I'm I think I'm conditioned. I think I'm too conditioned. Well, I'm gonna break you of that. Uh, yeah, well, it's already too I'm late now. Right now. Ever since we started this podcast together, you broke me on laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we understand that criminal AF is not for everyone, but we just ask that you at least give it a listen. If it's not for you, hey, thanks for checking it out. But if it is. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the debauchery. debauchery. So Garrett just, uh, he made me a Tito's. Tito. Tito's Red Bull and Watermelon Punch. Yes. So all this talk about Dahmer last week, I'm wondering if he, uh... I told you I'm going to get those Polaroids <laughs> any other way. <laughs> We're going to get to 100 subs on Patreon. <laughs> All right, so what do we got going on in Florida? What kind of cunt freaking ruined up Florida? Oh, yeah, it's Florida? a perfect time. All right, actually, since we're drinking Tito's, all right, hear, hear me out. We always do a Florida man. Mm-hmm. We're going to switch it up here. Because Florida, not only do wild people live there, Okay. when you go there on vacation, it, sometimes Florida, you know, gets it, the best of you. It consumes you. It consumes you. Yes. You become one of the people. Yes, You. Yes. exactly. Yeah. Especially when you're day drinking at a, at a beach bar. <laughs> mm. So uh, the headline reached, Vacationing Chicago cop charged with urinating in an ice machine at a Florida beach bar. Okay. Yeah. And he's a cop, too, which is crazy. Yeah. Henry Capuch, 30, is charged with simple battery and disorderly conduct after an employee at Jimmy B's Beach Bar told police he discovered the defendant pissing on the ice machine <laughs> around 12.32 a.m. Wait, was he pissing in or on? It says pissing on the ice machine. On the ice machine. Okay. The bar is located at Beach Co- the Beachcomber Resort Hotel in St. Pete's Beach. I actually know exactly where this is. Really? And that is a high-end beach bar. Like, it's, it's Beachcomber is a, a, a nice resort. So he, he's drinking top-shelf fucking alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it turns around and pisses on the ice he's, machine. You know, yeah, he's on the ice machine just... All right. According to the report, the bar employee told police he asked Capuch to stop soiling the ice. Okay, so he was pushed. <laughs> How proper is there, that? There's no way they're they're writing that because you know damn well he said, "Dude, are you pissing on the ice?" Yeah, stop <laughs> pissing on the ice. But the the off-duty police officer began verbally cussing the victim and pushed him a couple times with both of his hands. All right, so now we have battery. Mm-hmm. All right. Capuch also shoved a security guard who saw the incident, the report says. When sheriff deputies found Capuch lounging on the sand with his girlfriend, the five-year Chicago police veteran was actively resisting and initially not obeying lawful commands while being detained. Wow. That, that, <laughs> that's what I mean. You could be, right? You could be yes. an outstanding person. Oh, yeah. Law enforcement officer. Mm-hmm. What? Whoever. Yep. When you get that Florida, uh, that Florida juice and that Florida sunshine yeah. in your <laughs> you you start thinking about tractors. Yep. You start. It's it just can get wild. It can get wild. I can see though. I can see how this happens mm-hmm. because I mean I've been to Mexico and an all inclusive. Yeah. The first two nights there don't. I mean you're usually in bed the, the entire day. Yeah. It's not fun. Now I pissed on some uh, 
remarkable things in my day, but I've never pissed on an ice machine. Remarkable? Remarkable. Now, uh, real quick question. Yes. Have you ever been at a bar where they have the ice in the trough? Yes. And, like, everybody's, like, just hanging out? Yeah. It's the weirdest thing for me. Like, to, like just, why? Just leaving your ice out like that? No, it's just a, a trough with ice in it. Like, yeah. just, and, and just come in, I don't know, it's just, maybe he thought it was a trough. And he. You know what I mean? Maybe, listen, we're giving the hey. guy. Hey. We're, we're being hard on this guy. He probably just thought that was the bathroom. Yeah. He's been to win too many nightclubs or shady clubs at that. <laughs> oh, man. All right. For this episode, we need to travel back to 1989. Oh, wait. We're going to the studio chloroform time capsule. We're getting, we're getting ready. We're getting ready to go. So. Yes. Do you have everything you need? You got a phone charger? I'm ready. I got my vape. Yeah, I ready. got my fucking Tito's and. Tito's and watermelon. Did you go to the bathroom? Uh, no, I can Because hold I'm not stopping along I the way. Can, I can hold I it. Wait, wait, can we stop? <laughs> We're going back to 1989. Can yes. we stop at 1988? I'm, I'm not stopping at 98. <laughs> Come on. I'm not stopping at 98 before we, before we get there. All right. So now that we're ready, let's fire up the Studio Chloroform Time Machine. Let's punch in the coordinates. 1989, Rochester, New York. And here we go. I think I need to get an air freshener for this thing. Started getting musty after one, I know. one travel. Oh, wait. Can you hear that? I think we landed next to some break dancers. I can always dig this music. Yeah. Wait, are, we, are we at the mall? <laughs> are we at the mall? <laughs> are we at the mall? Let's go get some glamour shots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I used to do some popping and locking back in the day. Uh, no shot. Yes. I want to see. Break out the sheet of cardboard. DJ, DJ Dave. No, I was more I was more of a upper body break dancer. Oh, you didn't, you didn't start spinning. No, mm. I, was just, I was just a popper. Popper in the locker. My brother, on the other hand, he was all into like the backspin and, and whatnot. Uh, you know, do, doing that like cool dance before you break into your backspin. Well, you know the story about me, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to literally break dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in 1989, Nintendo releases the first ever Game Boy, officially marking the beginning of millions of children turning into zombies. Hater, Garrett. <laughs> Hater, Garrett's a streamer. FYI. Hater. I had to throw that in there for him. <laughs> Uh, the showdown in Tiananmen Square came to a head when 100,000 students assembled in the square to protest China's authoritarian communist government. This resulted in a video scene around the world of the lone protester squaring off with a tank. Iconic photo, by the yes. way. Throw away your cassette tapes, kids. Sony releases the first CD player for children. Boom. It plays a five-inch compact disc and features music search so you can skip right to your favorite song. As well as a three-inch speaker and a jack to plug in your headphones. Wow, that was that was life changing. Let me tell that. you something. I remember the first CD player and what a fucking invention it was. Because, you know what? Because when you had the tape player, you had to like fast forward. Yeah, of course. And CD boom goes right to the fucking song. It's yeah, great. But it's weird how nine eighty nine we were the first CD player came back. But I clearly remember having cassette players, and I mean I was born ninety one, so. We're talking probably nine, by 96, 95, 96. Yeah. I, well, I, I, I mean, still had cassettes at that you point. You just don't throw away your cassette player. No, because, yeah, yeah, that's all you had was your cassettes right. to play. You still you had to build up your CD stock, yeah. you know, before you could actually... Now, later on, I remember session. having my, my Walkman and all that stuff, yeah. but I, I remember having a cassette player. Do you still have CDs now, or do you no, stream everything? No, I don't, you don't have I don't any, have any don't physical have media. No, fees, and there's no physical media in my house. Really? I promise you that. Wow. Okay. The Exxon Valdez ran aground and ruptured its hull, spilling 240,000 barrels of oil into Prince William Sound. The spill harmed and killed thousands of wildlife, which eventually spread across a thousand miles of coastline. The Registered Partnership Law was passed in Denmark, marking the first country in the world to grant same-sex couples many of the same rights and responsibilities of marriage. Give it up. Yes. Way ahead of the curve, too. Way ahead of the curve. Way ahead of the curve. Way ahead of the curve. By the year 2000, the Netherlands became the first country to fully legalize same-sex marriage. Canada was passed in 2005, England and Wales in 2013, the U.S. in 2015, and Australia in 2017, to name a few. God. USA and Australia, what are we doing? We're a little, a little behind, man. Kind of trend, yeah. I will, I will say this, but I'll get too political, yeah. which is getting political. But if two people love each other, 
who the fuck has a right to say that they can't be together and enjoy the same privileges? You know what I mean? With that being said, who the fuck wants to get married? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been down the aisle twice, and let me tell you, it's not what it's all cracked out to be. No comment, Garrett? <laughs> no, yeah, I'm not getting in trouble for this one. <laughs> On January 24th, 1989, a man by the name of Ted Bundy, you might have heard of him, had lightning bolts shot through his brain as he expelled urine and fecal matter into his pants. Yeah, I like it. I like the description. Hey, <laughs> have you ever seen the picture of his head? Yes. Oh man, that's fucking, a good one. If you guys have not, Google search Ted Bundy uh, electric. Uh, his death photo. Yeah, his death photo. Yeah. Now, living in 1989, the average income was twenty-seven thousand four hundred fifty in the U.S. The cost of a new home was one hundred twenty thousand. Gas was ninety seven cents per gallon. That's pretty good still. Which was great to fill up your brand new Ford Probe that you oh just God. drove off the lot for twelve thousand five hundred. That car is so ugly. Ford Probe. That car is so ugly. <laughs> this girl I was dating in high school had a Ford Probe. Oh, she thought she was <laughs> hot. Oh, that shit that with that hot. too. Yeah, it was. she thought that was hot shit. Yeah. She's pulling up. <laughs> in 1989, the population of New York was seventeen million nine hundred fifty thousand. There were 203,000 incidents of violent crime, of which there were over 2,200 murders, 5,200 rapes, 104,000 robberies, and over 91 aggravated assaults. Rochester, where we are right now, in this very moment, in 1989, thanks to our time machine, <laughs> Rochester had 44 of those murders, including the ones we're about to discuss right now. Wow, that's actually pretty high. So buckle in, folks. The story is about to make your toes curl. Let's jump right in with Chapter 1, The Genesee River Killer. This episode of Criminal as Fuck contains descriptions of disturbing graphic violence, which may be offensive to some people. Listener discretion is advised. On December 28, 1989, a man who went by the name of Mitch began a 15-minute trek that he hadn't taken many times before. He left his apartment at 241 Alexander Street in Rochester, New York. He took a left on Gardner Park and then a right on South Union Street. Within a couple of minutes, he was on the inner loop, a beltway that leads to Interstate 490. He got off the exit for Allen Street, which passes over the Genesee River. Then Mitch took a right onto State Street, and where State Street meets Lake Street, he took another right onto Lyle Avenue. Lyle Avenue leads to a downtrodden section of town known for epidemic drug use and prostitution. Mitch was comfortable in this environment. It was a great place for him to blend in. He might even say that it was possible to become invisible to the others who call this area home. He was on a mission. He drove to Lyle Avenue to satisfy an appetite that couldn't be fulfilled in his other life. Driving up and down the strip, he set his sights on a young woman. Not much is known about her other than her name, 20-year-old Felicia Stevens. Felicia got into Mitch's car and wasn't seen again until December 31st, dead. A manhunt was put into motion for Felicia's killer the ninth known murder victim and twelfth to go missing from this area in the last year and a half. The media during this time had given the murderer a few different names. The Monster of the Rivers, the Rochester Strangler, and the one that eventually stuck, the Genesee River Killer. As with other serial killers, it was known that many had revisited the areas where previous bodies had been found. Authorities ramped up their search including aerial surveillance. On January 3, 1990, a police helicopter was searching the area around the Salmon River. They noticed a car parked on a bridge and a man looking off to the side, apparently masturbating. Frozen in the water below was the outline of a body. The man jumped back into his car and drove off with the helicopter not far away. They followed him along Highway 31, and then to Route 259 before calling patrol cars to continue the tale. The man then exited his car 
and walked into Wedgwood Adult Home. Police followed him inside and found him in the basement. They asked for his ID. The man standing before them, soon to be identified as a Genesee River killer, was Arthur Shawcross. Arthur Shawcross could tell a good story. No matter how graphic or repulsive, he would tell it as if it was a matter of fact. A lot of stories he told were so far-fetched, there's no way they could be true. Or could they? From a very early age, Shawcross claims to have developed an obsession for sex. By his own admission, he would experiment with the boys and girls from the neighborhood at the age of seven. He would attempt to have sex with various animals, cows, sheep, and he says that he even killed a chicken during intercourse. These acts could be one part of the McDonald Triad. He claims that his appetite for sex began when his aunt Tina would force him to perform oral sex on her. He stated that he would have sex with his sister Jeannie and his cousin Linda, an accusation both vehemently deny. He goes on to say that he was caught performing oral sex on the sister of one of his friends, and when the friend threatened to tell on him, Shawcross performed oral sex on him as well. And then there was his mother, Bessie, who, according to Shawcross, would sodomize him repeatedly with a broom handle. He would also become a bedwetter up to the age of 14, part two of the McDonald Triad. Whether factual or not, he paints a vivid picture of a tumultuous childhood. School wasn't much better for him. He was a loner and his classmates would constantly make fun of him. In retaliation, he would violently bully the kids in the younger grades. During these years, he would come under suspicion for a number of arsons, completing the McDonald Triad, as well as burglaries. After failing to pass ninth grade in 1960, Shawcross quit school and what followed would be only described as mayhem. More fires, more robberies, and the final straw came when he was caught smashing out a shop window. Shawcross was sent to jail for the first time in 1963. As we discussed in the story, Arthur Shawcross was obsessed with sex from a young age. Yet he often had trouble maintaining an erection throughout his life because normal sex, as we'll call it, didn't do anything for him. As far as he can remember, Shawcross said his life was revolved around sex. He was born premature, so he instantly had the constant affection from his mother and other female relatives. And as he grew older, like around five or six, he would constantly talk like a baby to maintain this affection. And by doing so, he alienated himself away from the rest of the family because the men and the boys of the family perceived, perceived him as being too feminine. He failed to make any lasting friendships from childhood because of these same reasons. Now, one particular instance solidified Shaw Cross's view on sex. As a child, he was picked up by a man as he was walking home from school. The man pulled out a knife and began performing oral sex on him. When Shawcross failed to keep his boner, the man went ballistic, like flipped the fuck out. So he ripped off Shawcross's pants and violently sodomized him. From this point on and into his adult life, he either had to experience pain or give pain in order to maintain his erection through completion. Out of all these stories that we've done so far, he, this, this kid has the worst upbringing, I feel like. Oh, yeah. It's in the upper a, echelon of it, shit. It has to. Yeah. Like, to be sexualized that bad at, from that such a... Like, it, it, there's no wonder why he, his, his wires got crossed at some point. And not not only was it was this just his mom or, or like, your dad. Usually, you, you know, you get molested by a relative, just one or two. It, it was multiple people performing right. sexual acts on him at a young age. Like, his aunt... Like, what, what was wrong with this family to begin with? Well, when, It seems like being over-sexualized was, was, th was going throughout the entire family. Right. Now, his family, when, you know, when, once he was born, his mother moved in with, with the grandmother because his father was, was still in the service. 
So she lived with the grandmother until his father got out. And then when he got out, they, they moved into basically uh, this area where multiple other family members either lived currently or moved into. His entire childhood and area was filled with cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, because right, they all lived in this one area. Yeah. They, they actually called it, there was a name, they called it Shawcross Corner. Because there were tens, 20, 30, 40, 50 chalk crosses who lived right in this uh, general vicinity. So you would think that with that amount of family members, you know, there would be protection, there would be love, there would be... You would think. You know, no, this actually worked against him. Yeah, and then basically drifters coming in and out and being in this part of this kid's life, this poor boy's life. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say poor boy, but... Well, yeah, I mean, you you think that, especially with the man who... who uh, gave him a ride and sodomized him and just thinking about you know how he would talk like a baby and his relatives thought he was you know a little too feminine and whatnot you know word spreads you know what i mean like one person talks another person talks another person talks yep. now there's nothing that actually says this but you can kind of picture him being a young boy and kind of passed around that people can have their fun with yeah you know yeah. I mean? yeah yeah he gets around the block Right. That, oh, he won't say a word. Yeah. And and this kid sh- clearly shows every, the, the triad, mm-hmm. off the rip. Bedwetter, killing animals. Arson. Arson. Like, yeah. every red flag that you can have. And yeah. it, it's, he just, he didn't have a shot. He didn't, he had no, he didn't have a shot at all. Yeah, he was picked on in school. And, um, and well, also, he would be the bully, too. Yeah, he would reciprocate the Yeah. To, which was, which is actually kids. a different aspect towards it. But we'll go into a little bit more on how his development, especially as an adult, affects how he perceives other people in Chapter 2. After a short stint in jail, Shaw Cross married his first wife, Sarah, in 1964. Their marriage was rough from the start, filled with bizarre behavior and violence. But still, they had a son. When Shawcross was arrested for breaking and entering, Sarah called it quits and he gave up his rights to his son, never seeing him again. 1967 brought a major change for Shawcross. Other than getting married for a second time to a woman named Linda after a brief courtship, at the age of 21, he was drafted into the army and served in Vietnam as a supply clerk bringing supplies of ammunition and weapons to war zones. While there is no documentation that Shaw Cross actually fought in a war, he claims to have taken 39 lives in the conflict. One particular story was when he found two Vietnamese women hiding weapons in a bush. He claims to have shot one of them and tied the other to a tree. The one he shot was still alive when he cut off her head and placed it on a spike. He cut off a piece of her thigh and cooked and ate it. He performed oral sex on the second woman before raping her and shooting her in the head. His lust for sex and violence didn't include just the enemy. He set his sights on prostitutes as well, some as young as 11 years old. In his own words, narrated by Gavin Jari, The VC put razor blades up whore's vaginas. Shove them inside a cup deep and where you never know until it was too late. When the GIs would fuck them, they would slit their penises to shreds or cut them clean off. I was with some guys, ROK Koreans, who took a whore, put a fire hose inside her and turned on the water. She died almost instantly. Her neck jumped about a foot from her body. Another time, we took another whore and tied her to two small trees legs to the trees bent down. She had a razor blade inside her vagina. She was cut from her anus to her chin. Then the trees were let go. She slit in half, left there, hanging between the trees. Shawcross said that his time in the Vietnam War made him an animal, making it very difficult to control his violent and sadistic urges. In 1969, Shaw Cross returned home to his wife. He would have violent outbursts and would beat Linda. Vivid flashbacks and nightmares would lead a psychiatrist to recommend that Shaw Cross be institutionalized so they could provide him with therapy, but because of Linda's religious beliefs, 
she refused to sign the paperwork. The beatings and destruction would continue. Later that year, Shawcross was charged and convicted of setting fire to a paper mill in the factory where he was employed. He was sentenced to five years in prison, and his time there would be filled with more violence. He claimed he was raped by several other inmates, and when he exacted his revenge, he was shipped to another prison to finish his term. Linda divorced him while he was still in prison, which deteriorated his mental state even further. Upon his release in 1971, his attempt at a normal life fell short. By his own admission, Shawcross was once again having sexual relations with his sister until she became pregnant by her boyfriend. She then introduced him to her friend Penny, and after a brief courtship, Shawcross was married for a third time. Things seemed to be turning around for Shawcross, until whispers began to emerge that he sexually assaulted Penny's younger sister. To avoid the turmoil that was affecting his personal life, Shawcross picked up a new habit. He would start fishing in the nearby streams and rivers, which was also popular with the neighborhood children. Now in Vietnam, as Shawcross would go on to say, was his playground. He had numerous stories and claims from when he was over there, including the story we just shared. He claims to have savagely raped and murdered countless prostitutes and locals, including one as young as 11 years old. He said the war brought out his animal instincts. Yeah, when we were discussing the story earlier, me and Dave actually, you know, looked up how many serial killers served in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And the number will actually just, like, blow your mind. 31, right? 31. 31 serial killers served in Vietnam. Yes, that we know of. Yep, that we know. Yeah, the ones that... You know, didn't one that get, actually got caught. Actually got caught, and it, it it goes to show there's so many there's so much controversy behind that war. A lot of a lot of people were pro, a lot of people were for, a lot of people were against, mm -hmm. and you can't deny the stories that come out from right. that time. It's 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 actually horrible. Yeah, and some of the notable ones from those 31 was obviously Arthur Shawcross. Then we had James D'Angelo, who was the Golden State Killer. Yep. Gary Ridgway, who was the Green River Killer. Uh, William Bonin, the freeway killer. Randy Kraft, the scorecard killer. Mm -hmm. uh, Leonard Lake from uh, Miranda Tapes. Do you remember the Miranda Tapes? Yeah. Where uh, Charles Eng put the, the girl's baby in the friggin' oven and cooked yep. it. And also uh, Roy Norris, one half of the toolbox killers. There is some articles out there that kind of share the correlation between the Vietnam War and the outbreak of the 70s of serial killers. Yeah. Because the 70s well, was the decade of the serial Of course. And, you know, PTSD and all these guys went over there and almost fulfilled their darkest fantasies. Right. Because they, they had the opportunity to. Yeah. Now, there's actually a story I heard from someone I know, older gentleman, obviously served in Vietnam, who said that he was a driver for uh, his commanding officer. And, you know, typically, you know, when we drive down the road, someone's crossing the street or someone's in the road, you know, we slow down. That's the normal way of life, correct? Now, when he was over in Vietnam, he said that he was driving his commanding officer down this, you know, side dirt road or whatever. And there was a family that was walking down the road. You know, children, mother, father, you know, there was probably like 10, 15 of them. Normal instinct, normal civilized instinct is to slow down. You know, make sure they get out of the way. Of and course. his commanding officer flipped out on him. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, you do not stop. You do not slow down. You do not do anything because it could be a fucking ambush. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. They, they would definitely use yeah. civilians and, and women and children. So uh, he actually had to run them over. That, horrible. Horrible. Horrible, horrible. And that, that goes for so many wars, too. Mm -hmm. I almost think it's comical. The mindset of uh, uh, Shawcross too, because he he's mad, right? That these women are putting razor blades inside them. Yeah. You know, like all oh, these little these, these girls, they, they trick us, they trick us. And I was like, no. There's countless stories of these girls doing this in Vietnam, right. and not because they're trying to trick you, because they are so afraid, because okay, it happened right. so often. Right. But it's amazing how his mind in that in that statement from him switches. Like, oh, oh they're doing it. They're to doing us. it to us. Right. No, these these women, you're invading the country. Yeah. Right. Whether you know everybody has their own 
politics aside or whatever like that. Well, politics state that uh, every single Vietnam vet, they're proud of their service, but the the consensus is they should have never been in Vietnam. Correct. Correct. I think I think a lot of people, majority, would say that. Yeah. But these women are they're in their own country, getting raped at the at masses mm-hmm. at the at the masses. And what what do you like? You're and you're mad at them for trying any way that they can to yeah. to protect themselves. It's crazy. It is crazy. So you you can take all of his stories with a grain of salt, or you can believe it to be true. But Shaw Cross was a supply clerk. Nothing against supply clerks. But, you know, while while clerks and MPs, maintenance, maintenance workers, etc., can get called to join the infantry during a shortage, it's only temporary until more experienced troops come in. Now, he definitely could have done the rapes he spoke of, but as far as being, like, in combat and killing Vietnamese for fun, as he says, is not likely. Yeah. Is it impossible? No. But is it likely? Also no. But, as we said, Shaw Cross can tell a good story. Like this one. He claimed when he returned from Vietnam, he was possessed by a 13th century cannibal named Ariams. I wanted to briefly talk on uh, the sexual relations between his sister. Because at this point, he's how old? He's already served in a war. At least 1920. And he's still having sexual relations with his sister. Uh, And then at that point, when she gets pregnant by her her boyfriend, she passes him on to her friend. Like, it's just levels of dysfunctional family. It's it's, right. It's good. Now, she'll she'll deny that any sexual relationship between them two ever happened. I know. That's that's the problem. Uh, I mean, to make a good story, I'm going to go and show across the side. Yeah. But, I mean, you just never know. You don't know because he told so many fucking stories. Yeah. You know? And he would tell them like as a matter of fact. I mean, obviously Penny's younger sister and Penny vouched for the fact that her younger sister was sexually abused by him. So there there's there's truth to this. There's there's truthful stories too. It's not just Well, I don't know how yeah, right. And I don't know how willing each of the parties were, you yeah. know. So now, real quick before we go on, do you think he picked up the fishing habit because he wanted to start fishing, or did he want to hang around the little the, the younger kids fishing? I think I think he enjoyed fishing, but he also used it to his advantage. Of course. Now we'll get into Shaw Cross's actual known rapes and murders, but it's not what you think yet. We're about to go deep in Chapter Three. Shawcross became friendly with the children around the Cloverdale apartment complex in Watertown, New York, where he and Penny lived. One child stood out from the rest. Ten-year-old Jack Blake quickly became a favorite for Shawcross, and the two of them would often meet up in the various fishing holes along the Black River. On the evening of June 4th, 1972, Jack's mother knocked on Shawcross's door. Jack hadn't been seen since the morning where he was playing near the vicinity of the Cloverdale apartments. Shawcross stated that he hadn't seen the boy. This was a lie. Shawcross had lured the boy into the woods under the guise of going fishing. Shawcross stripped Jack down naked and forced him to run through the woods. He chased him down, then raped, strangled, and bludgeoned his head before cutting out the boy's heart and genitals and eating them. Three months later, the search for Jack continued. Shawcross was a suspect, but with no evidence, he avoided arrest. Then eight-year-old Karen Ann Hill was found deceased under a bridge. Shawcross was the main suspect because of two tips the police received. First, Shawcross was the last person to be seen with Karen. And second, Shawcross was seen eating an ice cream cone just above the location of her body. He was brought in for questioning. After a full day of interrogations, Shawcross asked, What's going to happen to me if I tell you something? Shawcross admitted to raping, mutilating, and killing Karen Ann Hill. He also confessed to killing Jack Blake and admitted he would return to the site to have sex with his corpse. As part of a plea bargain, Shawcross wouldn't be charged for his murder if he showed them where Jack's remains were. He pled guilty to manslaughter of Karen Ann Hill and received a maximum of 25 years in prison. By March 1987, Shawcross had qualified for early release. 
Although he had received many evaluations over his years in prison, many stating that Shawcross showed antisocial and psychosexual tendencies, one evaluation deemed him a normal individual who accepts what he has done wrong and has made strides to correct his behavior for an eventual return to society. With Penny no longer in the picture, Shawcross contend a pen pal relationship he started in prison with a woman named Rose Wally. Although his conditions of release prevented him from leaving the area, he promised Rose they would soon live together and get married. Shawcross was moved from Watertown to Binghamton, New York because he was not welcome, and soon, the same would be for Binghamton, as well as his next stops in Delhi, New York, where he moved in with Rose in Fleischmann's New York. Shawcross and Rose finally settled down in Rochester. Shortly after Christmas of 1987, Shawcross met another woman named Clara Neal. He began a relationship with her while still married to Rose. Shawcross would often use Clara's car, and when Rose became suspicious, he played it off as he was just using her for the car. In February of 1988, Shawcross, in Clara's car, picked up a woman named Dotsie Blackburn. She asked him if he wanted a date. Shawcross paid her $30 for mutual oral sex. Things got a bit rough when Dotsie bit Shawcross's penis, drawing blood. He became enraged. He bit Dotsie's vagina and then tied her up with her own clothes. He drove her body out to the Salmon River and told her he was going to rape her. She laughed at him and began calling him names. Shawcross wrapped his hands around her neck and squeezed the life out of her. So Shawcross made a name for himself pretty quickly in uh, his new neighborhood. That he was hands-on with other children in the area as he was cited for spanking a child and stuffing grass clippings on their pants. Now Shawcross took a unhealthy liking to Jack Blake in particular. The two would always be seen together, going fishing, eating ice cream, you name it. Dude, where are the red flags? Come on. Yeah. Fuck, man. I, I get it was a different time, and everybody was just let their kids run around scot-free, but damn, man. Yeah, he would even go to Jack's door and ask his mother if Jack could come outside to hang that's, out. That's crazy. A grown-ass man. That's crazy. Grown-ass man. Can you believe that shit? If somebody showed up at your door, fucking 30-year-old, whatever. Can Jack come out and play? Yeah. No, dude, I told you. Mm. So in one instance, Shawcross knocked on the door and asked if Jack could go fishing. And when his mother refused, Shawcross agreed with her and told her that she that she made the right decision. What the fuck? Was, was he going to kill him then? Like, you made the right decision. Like, you just saved your son's life. Ugh. Now, with Karen Hells, was, she was found after Shawcross was eating an ice cream cone on a bridge overlooking her body. Uh, when they recovered her body, they found mud, leaves, sticks, and other debris shoved down her throat and in her nasal passage. Mm. Now, this is the thing that actually fucking gets me, okay? So we know quite a bit about Shawcross by now. And I'm sure the people in, at the time especially people in, in positions of power, police, prosecutors, they know that he's a pedophile. He's a rapist. He's a murderer. Oh, but he can... He's a cannibal. He's a necrophiliac. We're just going to let him just now, unlike his, go fishing with all the kid, neighborhood right, kids and yes. shit, too. It's, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't understand. So unlike his previous stories, these ones are actually confirmed to be true. He did murder two young children. He raped them both. He fucking did horrific things to them. Yeah. Okay. But yet, as we discussed, in 1987, he was deemed, quote, a normal individual who accepts what he has done wrong and has made strides to correct his behavior for an eventual return to society. Now, I would love to know who the fuck said this. No. Yeah. And if they kept their job. Th this is, that's probably the hardest part about this story. That he was released. It, it, it's like I said, I've said this on the podcast before. We have an amazing criminal justice department, right? It's, for the most part. For the most part. But man, when somebody drops the ball, yeah. it, they drop it hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, because anyone who knew this fucking creep's history up to this point 
knows that there is no rehabilitation in hell that can help this dude. Fuck him. Fuck whoever said it. The blood of 11 more women are on all of their hands. Yeah, Because of after his release... He went on a spray. Think about it, too. Is he, Your entire childhood, right? Mm -hmm. He's a pent-up, sexually aggressive person. Yeah. He's been it his whole life. Then you go away for 15 years? Mm -hmm. He was... Jonesing as soon as he got got out, obviously, because oh, yeah. you could tell, right. you know, uh, with the next chapter. I just, me as a pa as a parent at that point, I there's no way, man. If if I heard that he was getting out early on release, knowing what he did to those two kids, and if it was my own daughter or son, there's no way he's living. Like I I I, I you know I, I yep. it's not even talking a big talk or anything like that. It's actuality. Yes, I, I'll, I'll do twenty five years in jail. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yep. I don't care if I had if you had to put my family through that. It's whatever. You know, my wife will. My wife will got. You know, she has my my other child. Whatever. Yep. I don't care. There's no shot. Yep. I am going to let that pain be transferred to another family. And I'll even go to the extent. You know, you you. I know you joke around with stuff about me. You know, like being all oh, you the clitoris cannibal and all this other kind of stuff. Oh yeah, don't don't wait. Wait, uh, wait, 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 no, wait. No, 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 I will no. tell you right now. Wait, wait, hey, no. listen to our fellow listeners. <laughs> if you ever start hearing bodies <laughs> disappearing <laughs> around Norwich, Connecticut, <laughs> just know the first yeah. person I'm pointing the cops to is Dave Jari. Okay. <laughs> no, no I'm but kidding, seriously, I'm like if somebody did all this stuff to my kid, if I ever got a chance. Like, I'm not just putting a bullet in, it, in his head. I'm not, not not just stabbing him or whatever, whatever you get, you know, quick, easy death. I am fucking kidnapping this dude. And I am putting him through hours, if not days, yeah. worth of fucking torture. You know, it's funny. We, we try we tried to, on this podcast, we try to joke. We try to make light of situations and, and, and have fun with it because it's such a... It's just a horrible topic, but but whenever we, we when I feel, I feel like it's always been a trend. Whenever there's kids involved, we we get so emotional oh about God. these things. You have no idea, and it it just it is what it is. Those these guys have no place in society. Yeah, I mean, you you, you could talk about you know like in, in particular stories or whatever. You know, this, the adult victims. You know, a lot of now don't get me wrong. A lot of them do not deserve. None of them deserve. Yeah, of course, what they get. But you can also say, you know, they may have put themselves in situations where they could have, you know, where harm could be caused and whatnot. But with kids? Yeah. Like, kids don't choose. You know what I mean? They, they don't, they don't, ah, uh, I don't know. It's such an innocence. Yeah. It's taken. Yep. So, as I said, the blood of 11 more women are in all of their hands, as we'll discuss in Chapter 4. Grr. Arthur Shawcross sat in the car with her lifeless body until around midnight, and then drove to a bridge where he dumped her body into the river below. Uneasy that he may have been witness letting Dotsie into his car, Shawcross traveled back to the area to see if there was any activity regarding her disappearance. When the coast was clear, he stopped at a coffee shop, dumped Dotsie's clothes into a dumpster, and then drove the car back to Clara. The murder would be the beginning of the Genesee River Killer. Over the next few months, Shawcross, now known as Mitch to local prostitutes, would frequent Lake and Lyle Avenue quite frequently, and none would be the wiser that he was set to go on a rampage. In March of 1988, Dotsie's body was recovered downstream. Because of the cold water temperature, her body was well preserved, including the large missing piece of her vagina that Shawcross had ripped off with his teeth. But all of the damning evidence had been washed clean. Next was Anna Steffen in July of 1988. Anna was a part-time prostitute who had made fun of Shawcross when he couldn't get an erection. He punched her to the ground, and when she tried to escape by running into the river, Shawcross followed her in and drowned her. He didn't kill again for another year. In June of 1989, a homeless woman by the name of Dorothy Keeler, a woman Shawcross had known from the diner he often visited, as well as working as a housekeeper for his and Rose's apartment, began a sexual relationship. On July 29th, 
Shawcross was on his way to go fishing when he and Dorothy crossed paths. She asked if she could tag along, and on they went to the fishing hole. The morning was spent between fishing and having sex. They both hid under a makeshift shelter, and soon an argument erupted. Shawcross had accused Dorothy of stealing money from Rose and Clara. Dorothy denied the accusation and threatened him with telling the ladies that they were having an affair. Shawcross snapped, picked up a small log, and repeatedly beat her over the head with it. He left her body under a fallen tree. The Genesee River Killer was now in full force. On September 29th, he raped and murdered Patty Ives, who he accused of trying to steal his wallet when he removed his pants. On October 23rd, June Stott fell victim. She was a friend of Rose's who was intellectually disabled. Shawcross picked her up to go to the water, and while they were having sex, he commented about his surprise that she wasn't a virgin, and a fight erupted. He suffocated her by holding her mouth and nose closed. November 5th, Shawcross picked up Marie Welch, who he strangled because she was menstruating. November 11th, Francis Brown would enter Mitch's car, never to be seen alive again. Shawcross claims to have choked Francis with his penis, and then continued to have sex with her after she had died. Kimberly Logan was Shawcross's next victim on November 15th. Then on November 25th, Elizabeth Gibson met her fate. After having oral sex in Clara's car, Shawcross accused her of stealing money, so he strangled her. He claims the struggle was so violent, he broke the gear shaft in the car. By December, police were flooding the Lake and Lyle Avenue area trying to get to the bottom of the missing and murdered prostitutes. Shawcross was so under the radar, he evaded any suspicion even though he was a convicted child murderer and rapist. December 15th brought the disappearance of Darlene Trippy. Shawcross picked her up, and when he couldn't get an erection, Darlene became frustrated. Shawcross retaliated by choking her to death. June Cicero was picked up on December 17th. Again, unable to get an erection, he went into a rage and strangled her, dumping her body in the Salmon River. The final victim, one he would not be charged for, was Felicia Stevens on December 28th. This brings us back to the beginning of the story. Shawcross was caught after being witnessed masturbating above the frozen body of June Cicero. Shawcross was questioned for several hours discussing many things such as his marriages, his jobs, his sexual habits. Shawcross even offered up that he was the killer of Jack Blake and Karen and Hill. Later that night, they released him. In the morning, they picked him back up and interrogated him for several more hours, and after trying to figure out some inconsistencies, Shawcross eventually confessed to 11 murders. The Genesee River Killer was no more. He was sentenced to 250 years in jail. He passed away of a heart attack at 9.50 p.m., on November 10th, 2008. So with this chapter, I'm just going to break down the victims and, and when they were found and what happened to them. So we'll start off with Dorothy Blackburn. Uh, she was found on March 24th, 1988, uh, bearing deep bite marks around her genitals. Shaw Cross would later say that he killed Dorothy because she bit his penis and called him, these are his words, not mine, okay, a faggot because he couldn't keep an erection. Don't kill me on this. I'm just, re I'm just reading what he said. No, at least she gave up a little, you know, gave him a little sass. Yeah. Now, Anna Steffen, she was found on September 11th, 1989. Shaw Cross stated that after he drowned her, he couldn't be bothered with concealing her body, so he just let her drift down the river. Her body eventually became entangled with debris, and she rapidly decomposed from the summer heat. Dorothy Keeler's headless body was found on October 21st, 1989 by some local fishermen. Now, authorities failed to make any connection between Dorothy and Shawcross, even though they were often seen together, 
and spotted together at the same fishing hole countless times. Uh, her severed skull has never been found. It's cr- like this guy gets out of jail for violent murders, and then all these things start happening again. They know he's in the area. D- women are m- missing once a week at that point. Wait, like, wh- where are like nobody when they had the full, you know, who's done it board up in the the precinct? No one even had his name on this goddamn list. What is wrong with these detectives? Damn, we were, like last week's episode, we were just talking, we were giving praise to how good these detectives were to find Rawling, and these guys are just lost. Yeah. They're, they're lost. They have, they have no, no clue. No fucking clue. So Patricia Ives, she was found on October 27th, 1989, under scraps of construction material. Shawcross states that when Patricia began to cry after he pushed her to the ground, he violently sodomized and strangled her. Frances Brown was found on November 11th, 1989. Shawcross dumped her body down a trash-filled embankment. Now the force of her body going down the hill freed a lot of the trash from the grass and whatnot. So much so that police thought that she was intentionally concealed. Uh, Marie Welch was found in late November 1989. Shawcross originally claimed that Marie was killed because she tried to steal his wallet. But he later changed his reason to the fact that she was menstruating. Imagine that shit. Yeah. A normal human function. Yeah. I'm going to fucking kill you now because you have your period. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Shawcross has got to be one of the most violent. Oh, like, without, yeah. Without a doubt. Like, yeah. he had something going on. Yeah. They, head, dude. Yeah. Like, I don't even know. Like, I can't even, like, put myself. Like, a lot of times we talk about these guys. are like, well, if I was in this situation, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, I can't even, like. Yeah. He, he, he's on another, he's there. on another level as far yeah. as his, his sadistic thoughts in his head. When, when it comes to sexual, like, his fascination with sadistic sexual deviants. Now, June Stotts, she was found on November 23rd, 1989. After strangling her, he cut her torso open so that she would decay faster. He later claimed that he removed her vagina and some of her internal organs and ate them. What makes the situation even worse is that June's boyfriend at the time waited three weeks to report her missing. Uh, Elizabeth Gibson was found on November 27, 1989. She was in Shawcross's car performing oral sex when he claimed she tried to steal his wallet. Shawcross claims that Elizabeth was struggling so violently as he was strangling her, she broke the gear shift in his car. Darlene Trippy was killed on or around December 15th, 1989. After killing Darlene, Shawcross drove around with her dead body until he could find a secluded area to dispose of her. She was eventually found in an open woodland area. June Cicero was found in late December 1989. Shawcross claims to have returned to her frozen corpse to cut out her vagina, and he ate it. <laughs> now, the last known victim is Felicia Stevens, was found December 3rd, 1989. Shawcross never revealed any details about her murder or who she was, other than that she was, again, in his words, the black woman. She was found in a general area of both Jean Cicero and Dorothy Blackburn. This was the date that Shawcross was witnessed masturbating on the bridge over their bodies. Yep. So, now after knowing everything about this guy, all the victims that he that he killed, and the time in prison, the fires, the sex with animals and everything, how did he go undetected for so many fucking years? You know what I mean? Like, like we talked about earlier, like, all these women started disappearing and being murdered, and Arthur Shawcross lives right down the street. Yeah. Like, why wasn't he, like, automatically... It it just goes to show why there is an FBI that will come in at that, you know, at a certain point and be like, all right, because everything's state by state, lines by lines, county by county. By county. Yeah. And sometimes you're just not up to par. You're not, you're not doing a good enough job. So, I mean, it just shows perspective on, like, why we have someone to come in and step in and, and right. really like It'd be like because uh, okay. I mean if you think about some of those rural places down south and and stuff like that that don't have the manpower right. or you know the the tools to to actually solve a crime like this but I mean to be fair 
this wasn't that hard. This wasn't this wasn't hard and like this was right under their nose. Yeah, this was under their nose. Yeah, They're, they have no not even go question the guy. Bring the guy for questioning. I'm not saying that you have you don't even need evidence because he he folded. I mean, look at before when he got before he went to jail for 15 years. He folded in two seconds. Right. When he got brought in for custody. So it just goes to show you, if they just brought the guy in and talked to him for a little bit, could have most of these murders been prevented. Yeah, because he likes to talk. Yeah. If you watch any of his videos, the dude will talk for hours. Yeah, I, I highly suggest Whether, you guys, if if you're interested in, you know, seeing a true evil, watch an interview with this man. Yeah. You know, there's plenty on YouTube. You can find him anywhere. Zero fucks. Yeah. He gave zero fucks about any of these people. All right, folks, before we go, if you liked what you heard, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to become one of our amazing criminals on Patreon. Visit patreon.com backslash criminal AF. There's five tiers. You can donate as little as $2 a month to help the podcast. Just visit patreon.com backslash criminal AF. Links to our support, socials, merchandise, and more are in the episode description. Hey, if you guys are, you know, Christmas is upon us. Go check out... Uh, still got time. Yeah, we still got time to order your Criminal AF Christmas sweater for your next holiday function, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes. It's signing off from Studio Chloroform. Keep your head on a swivel and take care till next time. Now, now give me our theme music. See ya.